Welcome to PD Connect, connecting the Parkinson's community with resources, information, and each other. We're pleased to welcome John Alexander back to the podcast. In this second part of our chat with John, he's going to share an acronym he's developed for facing the challenges presented by Parkinson's. As I mentioned in the last episode, he calls it thriving. Welcome back to the show, John. Thank you, Chad. Welcome back. Thanks, Tanya. Hey, John, we're glad to have you back on the show again, and in particular to come back and talk about this acronym that you address in your book, which is called Thriving. The acronym is called Thriving. The book's called The Journey Begins with a Thousand Miles. Before we get into that, it's been just over a little over a week since we recorded the first part of our interview with you, but you've had a pretty eventful week. Would you like to share what went on over the past week with our listeners? Yeah, I'd be glad to. This actually started a little bit, a little ways further back. One of the things I may have mentioned in our first conversation was that I'd had deep brain stimulation surgery, also known as DBS, in October of 2016. And my procedure was very successful. The one unique aspect about that was that I was the first person in the United States to be implanted with the St. Jude Medical Infinity DBS system, which is a multi-directional device and also has some other advancements in that the patient controller that I was given where I can choose between programs and choose between the amount of power that I'm getting is like a an Apple iTouch device. So it's all Bluetooth and programmable, you know, very sexy. (laughs) But the 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 results that I was hoping to get truly came through. I had much less in the way of tremors, rigidity and dystonia. And that went along fine for about a year and a half. Well this spring I started to notice that my tremors were coming back, and I figured that I'd go up and get an adjustment to my system and uh, be all set. But what we discovered and was confirmed with an MRI was that actually a benign cyst had developed in my brain right at the spot where the device had been implanted. And so essentially, it was like sending the power through all this fluid, and the power was not getting to the spot in the brain where it needed to go to control my Parkinson's symptoms. So the decision was made to remove what's called the lead or the wire that goes into the brain. We did that back in June and then did another MRI in September. And we received good news at that point, And that was that the cyst had shrunk by 60%. And that allowed the opportunity to then have the DBS system re-implanted and get back under power again. And I had that done this just this past week on November 29th. I'm really pleased to say that already I'm feeling the results because my battery or device was still in my in my system. They just had to reconnect the cords or the leads. And I'm already starting to, you know, feel the benefit of the of the power, starting to reduce my medication slowly. And um, very much looking forward to getting back to how I was doing you know, prior to this spring. So that's my exciting news for the moment and of which I'm you know, extremely grateful for. That's great news, John. Welcome back to Robo World. Thank you. <laughs> Spoken from another person who's part of Robo World, as she puts it. Well, and I'd share with our listeners too that both John and Tanya have undergone DBS, deep brain stimulation, undergone that procedure. And uh, if they'd like to reach out, John, I, I imagine you'd be fine with listeners reaching out with questions about DBS through your role as a with the Davis Finney Foundation, if they want to reach out to you that way. Or if you want to reach out to us here on the podcast, you could reach out to PD Connect Podcast at gmail.com. Again, that's PD Connect Podcast at gmail.com. And is through the Davis Finney Foundation the best way to contact you, John, or is there another way? That, that would be great. Uh, that would work out. Just go to Davis Finney Foundation, look for the ambassadors, and my contact information is shown on their website. Okay, perfect. So getting back to the, the topic that we want to talk about today, thriving, this acronym thriving, the first letter T stands for uh, turmoil. Could you talk a little bit about, well, and actually before we get into that, let me ask you, what led you to come up with this acronym for meeting the challenges that you face and that others face in the daily life with Parkinson's? Well, I think like one direction I could take it was, you know, some of the, many of, much of the advice I got early on was simply from reading Michael J. Fox's books. And one of the things that Michael J. Fox is quoted as having said was, I have no choice about whether I have Parkinson's. I have nothing but choices about how I react to it. 
in those choices, there's freedom to do a lot of things in areas that I wouldn't have otherwise found myself in. And so, you know, I've, I've thought that you could do about three things when you are diagnosed with something like Parkinson's. You could just bury your head in the sand and not do anything. You could simply, you know, decide to cope or get by and, and just try to survive. You know, just, you know, take the medications you're told to and just not do much else. But there's a third level, which I consider as like the level to, to strive for at all times, and that's to thrive. And that's to make steady progress, to prosper, and to flourish. And so, yeah, it's a degenerative disease. But if you follow you know, the tenets of, of staying connected and active and exercising and being engaged, I think you can, you can find a way to actually rise above you know, what was what was this you know, pronouncement that was given to you and, and make your life uh, you know, better all the, all the way around. And I also realized that you know, naturally not everyone's going to come down with Parkinson's, but there's many situations in one's life whether it's your work situation, you know, your overall career, relationships, and that ultimately this term of thriving applies to. So, yeah, if you like, we could, you know, go through the, you know, the the words that I assigned to each of the letters in that word, the acronym. Before we do, to go back to something you said about the three different ways that you can react to a diagnosis, the interesting thing is you can you can live through all three of those as various stages as Tanya has and as we both have initially she and I both put our heads in the sand then there came to a point where it was just coping and it was take the meds and do a little better job of managing daily life with the disease but you know not really necessarily take on a positive outlook not yet getting involved not yet connecting with the Parkinson's community and then to that third stage where she is today, where we are today as a couple, which is thriving, you know, in the face of the daily challenges and living a quality life and a life that in many ways is remarkably better than it was before. And I think that's an important thing for people who are listening who might be in a different, you know, our listeners could be in a variety of different places right now on their journey with Parkinson's and to realize, well, okay, if you're at the head in the sand stage right now, understand that there are those of us out here who are trying to connect and communicate and to let you know you don't have to stay there. You can move past that and you can get to what you're talking about in your book, which is thriving, notwithstanding the challenges of the disease. I completely agree. And I just jotted some, down something the other day, which was, you know, don't just cope. Don't just get by. Don't just make do. And don't just hang in there. You know, things, all, all viable things that people do. But again, always strive to thrive. And you've got to remember, you know, what is your focus as you're going through this? Of course, it's, it's, you know, sort of being the best you can be, but you're doing it for others around you. In the case of the two of you, and, and I also have, you know, my children and grandchildren, the two of you are, you know, raising a wonderful young, young man in your son. And, you know, he observes everything that you do. And if he finds you making that extra effort to make the most out of your life, even though you've been, you know, handed this diagnosis and, and some circumstances you didn't expect, that's going to make a huge difference in his ability to address situations that come his way later on in life. And I feel the same you know, in my family. John, I think you're absolutely right. In fact, Chase said to me a couple of months ago, he looked at me and he said, Mom, you're my hero. And I said, well, thank you, Chase. That's a very nice thing to say. Why am I your hero? And he said, because you get up every day regardless of Parkinson's, and you live your life, and you take care of me, and you're a good mom, and I love you. And that just warmed my heart. And well-deserved. It's uh, We really appreciate that, John. And I. it, it is remarkable to see what even an 11-year-old you know, picks up on and, and the maturity level they have that sometimes you don't realize how much they recognize what's happening day to day and, and how his mother is facing the challenges of Parkinson's with such extraordinary grace is the way I typically put it. By the way, you bringing up the subject of our son is, uh, you didn't know this, but it's a good preview for an upcoming episode. We're, we're going to talk with Sonia Mother about the topic of parenting. So for our listeners Excellent. out there, you can look forward to that. So moving into, uh, as we teased a little bit here, your acronym of thriving and starting with that first letter I mentioned before, turmoil, let's just kind of walk through it. And if you could first share your thoughts on what the T for turmoil means to you. Yeah, so naturally, you know, your diagnosis is going to going to be a bit unsettling, going to, you know, knock you back, you know, for a moment. And you may need to take some time to actually, you know, process that. 
even going as far as to say to grieve for the diagnosis that you've been given. It is, that is reality. You know, it's just like when someone, you know, that you care about, you know, passes away and is no longer in your life. There is a, there's a reason for the grieving process. It doesn't mean that you just say, okay, well, that didn't matter. No, of course it mattered, but you need some time to, to adapt to that. But your life may change, but th- over time, there's still plenty of room for good things to happen you know, in your life. So again, the, you know, the turmoil is, could be you know, also in specifically in PD, you know, the diagnosis, but again, it could be identifying any particular problem. You didn't ask for this problem, but it's there. And the reality is that you and you alone are the only one who can address how this, term, how this situation is going to be dealt with. John, it's the, the, one of the thoughts I have after you, as you describe turmoil and, and the dealing with the initial diagnosis of being unsettling is one of the first things you have to do is to acknowledge the diagnosis. And I reflect on that because Tanya and I, when she was first diagnosed, going back to this idea of sticking your head in the sand for a long time, really didn't acknowledge the diagnosis. Tanya in particular, she didn't acknowledge it. She tells a funny story about, you know, trying to give me her pills to try to confirm that she didn't really have Parkinson's and see what the pills did to me. And I think it went on for, what would you say was the time period, Tanya, before you felt like you really accepted that you had, in fact, been diagnosed with Parkinson's? I don't think I truly accepted it until right before I had deep brain stimulation surgery. Which Um, was seven years in, right? Yes, approximately. I, I just kept my head in the sand and I was trying to live my life the way I thought I should be living my life and it didn't part there was no room for Parkinson's and that really just led to more frustration on my part because you obviously are limited in some things that you can and can't do with the disease and of course that differs from person to person but for me I was trying to live what I thought was the ideal life and be the ideal mom and the ideal wife and ignore the fact that I had Parkinson's and that was disastrous. Yeah, to grieve, you first have to acknowledge. I mean, I, I think that was one thing I'd add to it. Would you, would you agree that's kind of part of your thought on this first step of turmoil? Oh, definitely. Um, yeah, it's a matter of, you know, there actually is a form of acceptance. And sometimes that may take a while to, to get to. But it is, an, that's, that is truly an important first step. Because then you, you can see what the issue is before you. And then you can start working working on the issue. You know, one of the things that is challenging with Parkinson's is that for a number of people, getting a, a, an accurate diagnosis can take some time. And one, that's one of the reasons that research is so important. You know, there's not just a blood test or some simple mechanism that a person can go through and it says, okay, you, you definitely have Parkinson's or you have, you know, this specific version of Parkinson's. So, you know, the turmoil actually is, is quite disruptive. As you say, Chad, it's acknowledging it but then it's beginning to, to you know, get to work to figure out what you can do, you know, given that diagnosis, given that understanding. From there, you next move in the acronym to H, which stands for Honest Assessment. Can you talk a little bit about what you mean by Honest Assessment? Yeah, I think this is, this is truly getting the facts, getting the information that what you truly need. Because you know, one of the things that you will uncover, most likely, is that Parkinson's is not a death sentence. Quite likely depending on what age you get it, you're going to have it for a very long time. So it's important to know that, you know, your overall state of health, it's important to, you know, seek a diagnosis from professionals that are trained in delivering that. And as I've probably often said before, in my opinion, a movement disorder specialist who is a neurologist who has advanced training in Parkinson's specifically, they are the, that's the type of doctor you want to go to to get a diagnosis of Parkinson's. And based on that, they can set you on a path towards, you know, some treatment. And kind of tied in with the honest assessment, next up we've got the R for research. Research is obviously an important part of learning to live with Parkinson's, learning to to go back to what we're talking about, learning to thrive notwithstanding Parkinson's. For you, how did research play into your journey of getting to a, the place where you are today? Well, I think, and again, in this research, in this description of research, what I'm talking about is, you know, getting the information you need to know to deal with your condition the best way possible. Some people love to have, you know, maybe it's just a real scientific uh, mind that they have. They want to know all the facts. They want all the details. Other people just want that kind of highlighted. 
So what you need to do is find the information that you know works for you, speaks to you, and also not to get overwhelmed by the information. If you just you know watch the steady flow of information that's on either social media pages where people are, you know are, are trying to share what they're hearing, there's things coming out every day you know that might sound like the miracle cure. You know you need to to become a a, a cautious absorber of of that type of fact, that type of information, and and distill it down to the facts. You know, check the sources. Where is this coming from? How big was the study? Is this is this really true? Is this something I should get on board with? And you know, have I established a medical team that I can run this past to ask? Is that something that would be potentially useful in my situation? And then over time, you can you can build your knowledge base, but you don't have to do it all at once. You make such a great point there, John, because research for each person may be different. You know, we've attended some events with the Michael J. Fox Foundation where there are individuals present in the room who are living with Parkinson's and their care partners who clearly are heavily following, they're closely following the different research programs that are out there, both those focused on a cure, those looking to improve daily life, clinical trials, that sort of thing. And they're very interested in the research and they probably, it it seems like follow updates on an almost weekly basis. And then there's research for people like Tanya and I that approach it more from a standpoint of exercise, diet, information available from nutritionists about ways to improve diet to help with the symptoms. Not that the other research isn't extremely important, but as you point out, it's okay for different people to to view to decide for them what's most important in their daily lives with Parkinson's in terms of the topics they want to research and what they want to focus on. Exactly. And I think that's really important because I will tell you, I've sat in those rooms and listened to those people and thought, oh my gosh, we're not doing enough. We're not paying close enough attention. We're not looking at these different studies, you know, as, as closely as we should be. And it took some time to realize, no, we're doing different things. You know, we're mm-hmm. working on raising awareness, fundraising, participating in Team Fox, focusing on exercise. Not everybody has to do the same thing or deal with it the same way. Right. It's true. And I was going to add to your what you just said, Chad, and that it can be overwhelming if you're around people who are really heavy into research and they start talking about different genes and mitochondria and they start throwing around all these technical scientific terms. But you, like Chad said, you just have to go in at whatever level it was, you're comfortable at and not be intimidated because everybody has a place. Plus we're lawyers. So, you know, lawyers are not necessarily good at things like science and math. <laughs> <laughs> so moving on to the next letter, the I for initiative. And I really like this. This is a topic that I think we've touched on some on the podcast, and certainly we've been present at a lot of conferences and other talks where this is a focus, which is the role of being your own advocate for your own care. Can you talk a little bit about that? Right. I think, I, I think I've come to realize that the importance of that, you know, very much. You need to speak up for yourself. You need to make sure that when you go for a doctor's visit, you go and prepared. You've kept notes on what you've observed as changes for yourself. And so that you're communicating that with your, with your doctor so that they can make adjustments to be it your medication or your overall therapy path that are, are appropriate for you. And you need to build a, a support network. This includes your, your medical professionals, and not only a movement disorder specialist, but also physical therapists, occupational therapists, speech therapists. So you've got a number of people who are looking at you from all directions that can, can make observations. They can see the progress and help you make corrections you know, according to your course. There was one, one line I heard in a, probably in a podcast. This will drive the people who are English majors crazy. But it was, it was don't do nothing. <laughs> Meaning, you know, take that first step. You know, the, you know Jimmy Choi always says the you know the, the toughest step is is the first step. But once you make it and you start going down a going down a path, you get momentum and you build momentum. If you decide that you want to start you know running, and you start walking around the block and you slowly increase to you know walking around the block twice to you know moving a little bit faster, who knows? You you may be the one who's you know, running a, a New York City marathon sometime. So, you know, start, begin, you know, take take some steps in initiative and, and get moving, get doing. But, you know, think about, you know, 
this is where it's truly okay to think about yourself. I couldn't agree with you more, John. And I was chuckling. I was trying to hide it. But when you were talking about having family and a friend involved in your as part of your team, and it reminds me of the one time that Chad did not go with me to visit my movement disorder specialist. And I left and he said, well, what are you saying? I'm like, oh, I'm great. <laughs> did you talk to him about X? Nope. Did you talk to him about Y? Nope. Did you talk to him about Z? Nope. <laughs> Chad says, what did you talk to him about? And I said, I don't know. <laughs> I, I well, I think, it, we're really, I think we're really good at hiding things. Yes. <laughs> well, we've talked about this on another episode about the importance of family uh, care partners, that support network in the person living with Parkinson's and, in my case, the spouse, being an advocate as well, being, you know, going to those appointments and being able to communicate with the movement disorder specialist, this is what's going on. And in particular, because Tanya may go see the movement disorder specialist and present certain things about, you know, I've noticed this and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, the movement disorder specialist may ask, well, have you experienced this? Or are you, are you, you feeling this symptom? And she, she might say, oh, I'm not sure. I don't know. And as the care partner who's observing it daily, I sometimes can say, well, yeah, she is, or I've noticed an uptick in that, or I've, you know what I mean? I've I've noticed something different in whether it's energy level or tremor or, you know, whatever the symptom might be, sometimes non-motor symptoms. So like energy levels. So it, it really is important to have your support network be a part of that role of advocating for the health of the person living with Parkinson's going to to the next letter in in thriving, which is a V for victory. You already kind of hit on this a little bit, but it's the importance of the role of physical activity and achieving your own personal victories, which you already touched on a little bit in uh, talking about uh, what Jimmy Choi says and about walking around the block. But talk a little bit more about that. And, and of course, for you, part of that tied into cycling, which we talked about in the first episode. Right. I think it's I think it's real easy for someone diagnosed with something like Parkinson's to start, you know, start thinking. You know, there, there's many people who describe this as a disease, the disease of subtraction. I think it's Dave Iverson um, used that that line, and meaning that there's many things that get taken away from you, you know, over time with this disease, and just depending on, on your particular progression, you know, ultimately it could could mean that you don't have balance, you don't you you don't have the ability to to walk or do certain things. However, if you do set some goals, they can be very slight. But if you set them and achieve them, you get a, a you know we get a, a great you know sense of accomplishment you know from doing that. So again, whether it's walking, swimming, riding a bike, boxing, yoga, all of those things they help not only to keep your you know your muscles in tone and to push back against you know Parkinson's, but they also you know keep you alert. So it's important to exercise your brain just as well. I know some folks who have done make an effort to do a lot of work on brain quizzes, you know, kind of you know mental gymnastics, if you would, in a way. I did think up one the other day, which was this would be a real reach back for most people, but the game of tiddlywinks. I think it's a perfect Parkinson game. You play with these these two little you know discs or coins, and you try to flip something into a cup. I, sound, I know it sounds totally crazy, but you know, by just focusing on something that you know, different. You know, you, you keep your brain active, but you know this again is where the connection with other people is important. You know, keep up, keep ha- having conversations, keep being involved because that that helps as well. Some people have taken up painting or singing or even a musical instrument, but whatever the victory is, large or small, as Davis Finney says, every victory counts. So you know, for some people who are much more advanced, just the act of getting up and getting out of bed and getting dressed, you know, for the day is a huge sense of accomplishment. For someone else, it's you know it's crossing that finish line, but whatever it is for you, you know set yourself up for victory and and go for it. This reminds me of an incident in our household a couple of days ago. You know, I ha- with Parkinson's, I have trouble with dexterity in opening different things, mostly in the kitchen mm-hmm. and packages and. Um, so Chad tried to open some kind of, you know how bacon sealed real tight and, and right. it's like a sliver that you have to pull on to p- separate the plastic from the other plastic. Mm-hmm. 
Chad, it wasn't bacon, but it was a similar product and Chad could not do it. And so I said, bring it here. I'll try. And I was able to do it in less than probably 20 seconds. <laughs> and I was like, I started here and I go, yay, the person with Parkinson's in the house. <laughs> with the least amount of dexterity was able to open a package that the non-Parkinson's people couldn't. Perfect. And also, bear in mind that as she described, she accomplished it in 20 seconds. I think I'd struggled with it for well in excess of two to three minutes. And, <laughs> you know, Tanya, knowing me well, knew it was there were two options here. One, she could try to help. Or two, the bacon was likely to be thrown across the house at some point. <laughs> you know, That's right. <laughs> acknowledging my own weaknesses of uh, uh, lack of patience. And I mean, that's <laughs> not something that's, you know, life changing, but it was, it was a victory, uh, you know, for the day. That's right. Your Tiddlywinks idea, we talked about this off the air. I think it's brilliant. And we, we are very interested to try that theory out because I think you're absolutely right. And it's, it's a great example of some of the, the different creative ways that you can find to challenge yourself mentally or physically or work on your dexterity. There's another, there's an art form called Zentangle that uh, Tanya did for a while, and she comes back to you periodically that also has been beneficial to her with respect to her dexterity. So there's, you know, we don't have time to cover all the different avenues that you could pursue on this episode, but it's a great point that you can accomplish victory even from the smallest of things. And I think another important point is that the physical activity you engage in or whatever it is and those victories, those may change over time. They may change because you're not feeling the same benefit from it. They may change because your limitations are different. They may change because your symptoms are different and that's okay. And I've sort of, we've sort of been witnessing that recently with some people we know who've been avid runners that maybe aren't benefiting the same way from running that they once did and are realizing that they need a different type of physical activity, a different challenge. And so they're experimenting with other things that would give them that same benefit. In the case of Tanya and I, we're right now going through the process of, of learning and figuring out, is it really distance running, you know, marathons that are, that are ideal for Tanya, or is it increasing her pace at a shorter run? You know, is that where she'll feel the most benefit and, and is most suited not only to how it improves her symptoms, but also, you know, maybe is best suited to where we are at the stage of our lives and the time we can dedicate to an activity. So, Absolutely. You just got to evaluate it and do what's right for you. There's no one size fits all or one shoe fits all. The The next up, next letter up is inspiration. And this one we could talk about forever. And so we'll just hit on a little bit. But you point out that it's important to seek out people who inspire you and also to share what you know with others because you may be a form of inspiration to them. Do you want to talk about that for a minute? Yeah, this is this is one of the things I consider I consider, you know, three main kind of tenets when I think about, you know, my Parkinson's. One is activity, second is inspiration, and third is advocacy. And with inspiration, I think I was fortunate to find a number of people fairly early on who were addressing their Parkinson's in, you know, kind of in a, in a noble and a, a profound way. You know, they were not simply not going to let it get them down. And I think that's that is you know, something that's, that's worthy to to emulate, to try to do you do yourself. So I just started looking around and watching for people that would stand out. But as much as I found people who were doing some amazing things, you know, I also found something as simple as as I may have mentioned this before, but a gentleman in my exercise class who was slower than everyone else because his cognitive function is his has taken a hit with his Parkinson's. But he shows up every day, he's got a big smile on his face, and he, he does it and he, and he gets it done. And then I've, I've come to realize, you know, I've had you know, the good fortune, and um, Tanya, I know that you have too, uh, people will say to you, oh, you're an inspiration to me. And it, it's almost embarrassing at, at times, and yet it made me realize that that's a, res- a huge responsibility to take on. If you're going to, to set some goals, achieve them, and people you know, look to that and admire it and may take the first step to do their, do something for themselves. It's important to, to realize the responsibility that you, you have to continue to try to you know, live a life that is, is worthy of someone else stepping up. Uh, one quote I like is, you know, to the world, you may be just one person, but to one person, you may be the world. So... You know. I love that quote. When I read that in your book, I, it just melted my heart. I think it's so true on many different levels. 
that we don't realize the impact that we can have on just a person. Because, I mean, I know I often think of myself like, oh, I'm just Tanya Walker, the person living with Parkinson's, and um, end up being an inspiration to another person that I did, wouldn't even think, would not even think that I would affect. So yeah, I really I think, like I think this. I think this also ties in with the fact that, once again, you know, you're not alone. And if you, you know, find yourself seeking out people who, whom you admire, I think it's it's gonna, you know, you'll find that there's some things you can do just as well or better than they might do, but it's gonna help you, you know, get through each day and keep moving moving on. Absolutely. You know, you make the point. It's it's about identifying other people that you connect with in some way, relate to their, you know, a similar age or, you know, it's a, for example, it's another, you know, woman, you could say, I'm, I'm a woman living with Parkinson's. Here's an example of another woman like me, similar age, similar, you know, raising a child, similar challenges. And, oh, look, I see that this person, you know, either ran a fundraiser, or, you know, held a fundraiser or ran a race or did whatever it was. I could do that or I could do something else, something different. And right. for those listeners out there, maybe right now who aren't connected to uh, really connected to the Parkinson's community, maybe haven't made that commitment to connect. Let me just say this, having been a part of this community now as a, you know, as a, as the spouse of someone living with Parkinson's, this Parkinson's community is made up of the most inspiring, extraordinary people on the face of this planet. It is remarkable to go to Team Fox events and other Parkinson's events and see the individuals who are thriving with this, you know, living with Parkinson's and thriving, notwithstanding the challenges and the different things that they do with their lives that they might not have ever done without Parkinson's. It is truly remarkable. And when you get in a room full of people like that, whatever the event is, I mean, it, you just go to a Parkinson's walk by regardless of which foundation is putting it on and see the people around, that are there and the positive outlook and the ways they challenge themselves and the way they confront a life with Parkinson's with, you know, with joy in their heart. And it is, it can have such a profound effect on not only the person living with it, but a person like me, who's the care partner who may have my own struggles with it. And then to see this community become a part of it and become truly inspired by people like you, John, like people like Jimmy Choi, people like, I mean, I could go on and on and on of all the different individuals I met that I'm just amazed by. And it's so powerful. So I just, that's almost a plea to those out there who may be struggling right now and haven't connected with the community. Try to make that connection and, and allow yourself to be inspired by those around you, inspired to, to face this in a, in a different way and to start down a path of thriving, uh, notwithstanding the daily challenges. Yeah, I was going to say a, a path of thriving, and which leads to the next letter in never give up. Because I think it's so easy, you know, apathy is a symptom of Parkinson's that some people experience. I know I experienced it myself or went through an apathetic stage, but your never give up is so crucial. Yeah, and, and I've done some reading recently. I, I really like Winston Churchill and, you know, read a book about, you know, his, his life and all that. And, and you know, everyone always knows, of, thinks of him as simply saying, you know, never, never, never give up. And I was being determined, you know, dig your heels in. But actually one of the lines that he, he actually said was, never yield to the apparently overwhelming might of your enemy. I mean, yeah, Parkinson's is a, is a you know, 900-pound gorilla. But if you just keep, you know, keep on your path, keep doing the best you can, you have the responsibility to push back against it. And you definitely can do that if, if you just have that mindset that you're, you're not going to give up, you're not going to give in, you're, you're going to you know, rise above it and, and you know, live the best life you can live. And going back to something you said earlier about the example that you then set for those around you, and it, it may be a child, or honestly, it, it could be another adult in your life that you don't realize the way that them. everybody's got their own challenges, right? And so to see sure. someone who's thriving, notwithstanding a diagnosis of Parkinson's, then may 
inspire someone else or create a connection with someone else that looks at that and says, I've got these challenges in my life. Could be a relationship, could be financial challenges, could be some sort of health issue that's not Parkinson's. But then this person that's in your life sees the way that you're approaching things and going back to what we said a moment ago, is inspired by it. And there they get a sense of, uh, you know, my friend, my family member here who lives with Parkinson's is not giving up. I'm not going to give up. And, you know, tying that into what we said a few minutes ago about the role of, you know, the example that Tanya sets for Chase. I will tell you, I will share that when Tanya and I talked about raising our son and really before Parkinson's was it? Well, frankly, before we were really even talking about Parkinson's with each other, we always talked about the importance of wanting our son, if he knew nothing else, if he learned nothing else from us, the importance of always pick yourself up. I liken it to a boxing analogy. Always answer the bell. You always get up, Mm -hmm. no matter what, no matter what the challenge, you always get up. And to see her set that daily example for him is extraordinary. And to see that it is having the positive impact on him and that he is learning that life lesson, that no matter what you confront, no matter the adversity, you never quit. You never give up. Right. Which takes us to the last of the uh, letters in the acronym, which I love, which is gratitude. And you talk about the fact that even though you've been dealt a really, I call it, you said I've been dealt a bad hand, and I use a a similar analogy with Tanya. So you, I think I've actually used the expression, you've, you've gotten a pretty shitty hand. I uh, say I won the crappy lottery. Right. <laughs> but notwithstanding that, there is so much to be grateful for. Can you share a little bit about that? Yeah, because it's in be, in the act of being grateful that, you know, we realize and, and get a true measure of the, of the blessings that, you know, do come into our lives and the people that, you know, that make the, you know, you know, make those things possible for us. So I think I think by expressing gratitude, you know, you're acknowledging the people that are helping to make your life you know better and, and easier. And it ultimately adds more meaning, you know, meaning to your life. The you know, there have been books written about people who face you know the most unimaginable challenges and difficulties. But if they can still find a sense of meaning and purpose, then then it's it's possible to go on. And the, the way to do that is through gratitude. I was very fortunate that the person that helped me with this book was, I had a book coach, her name is Amy Collette. And Amy has her own book called the, simply called The Gratitude Connection, in which she, you know, she delves a, a great deal into the, you know, the, the spirit and the, and the you know, purpose and the, and the reason for, you know, for, for expressing gratitude. But it really does come back to you full measure. And, you know, there's so many people to be grateful for, your medical team, your friends, your family, you know, your care partners, whatever level they may be at. And it's, it's very important that you take the time to express your gratitude so that they, they do realize how much you appreciate it. I couldn't agree more. A gratitude is an essential part, I think, of anyone's life which goes to your point of this uh, acronym thriving can apply to many different life situations. But I think gratitude is just critical. Well, and to echo what you said, John, I mean, taking the time to express to your support network how much you appreciate the support you're giving. I mean, that's something that Tanya is very good at to let me know that she's grateful for the role that I play in her life, not not just as a quote unquote care partner, but as a husband, as a spouse mm-hmm. and as a father to our son. And, and I mean, it just makes a big difference. It makes a big difference in your relationship. It makes a big difference in whatever challenges you might be facing. I think this is a great place for us to wrap up with the thought of gratitude in our minds and in our hearts. And we are grateful, John, that you have joined us on this episode. We've really enjoyed it. It's amazing when we bring, I mean, we already know you, we've talked countless times, and yet having you come on the podcast is its own really wonderful experience. It's been very refreshing. It has, and it puts us in a better place, and we're both sitting here smiling. It's going to make for a great rest of the day for us, and and we really appreciate the time. And what I, before we sign off with you, I want to encourage our listeners again to go and pick up a copy of your book. It's called The Journey Begins with a Thousand Miles. I know it can be found on Amazon. Are there other places that our listeners can find it? It's just on Amazon at this time, but it is available both in print and a Kindle version for people who like to you know, go experience through a reader or something. I would encourage our listeners to check it out because it's really a good book. It's an easy read and it's inspirational. It's funny at times. 
and it's just a great entertainment and educational book. Absolutely. Thanks again for joining us on the show, John, and we'll have to uh, keep in mind future topics that we could bring you on to talk about sometime down the road. And hope everything continues to go well with your recovery from the recent DBS procedure, which it sounds like you're doing fantastic. It's, it's going great. I, I'm, I'm really appreciative of, of everyone in my medical team and you know, all the support of, of so many people who've you know, expressed interest and concern you know, before I went into the procedure. But yeah, you know, doing great. I, it's, it's hard to believe, hey, it's only brain surgery, right? <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> That's right. Hey, thanks again so much, John. Thank you, John. Okay, thank you. Happy holidays. Same to you. Thanks for tuning in for this episode of PD Connect. Please help us connect with the Parkinson's community by spreading the word about this podcast. You can find us online at pdconnect.org and on Facebook at PD Connect Podcast. You can also follow us on Twitter at PD underscore connect. Again, that's PD underscore connect. Until next time, this is Chad and Tanya signing off.